The orphan change was a method that was used to get poverty-stricken children off of the streets and into the houses of rural families during the mid-19th and early 20th century. People of the time were troubled by the increasing number of kids that were becoming a part of the homeless population. The vast number of displaced children was made up by a majority of immigrants. In 1849, New York had over 3,000 homeless children who lived and worked on the sidewalks. The orphan trains gained momentum from the railroad companies who supported the movement because they lacked profit from westward expansion. Reformers worked to respond to the needs of the impoverished children. Charles Brace was one of the most well-known reformers of this time. He established a Protestant child welfare organization, the Children's Aid Society of New York, which provided an alternative to orphanages. CAS initially became a shelter for urban youth with religious values while searching for families in the city to take in the children. These solutions were not efficient alone, so CAS started an emigration plan, which later was called the Orphan Trains. This plan changed the idea of institutionalized settings for children to increase the amount of children living with a family. Today, this is seen as the foundation for foster care. There must be some mistake. That's where I was told to put you. But this isn't fit for cattle. Well, you're going to have to get on, ma'am. This train is leaving. Board! All aboard! Train number seven, westbound. Board! Are we going or not? I'm gonna leave. All right. There were two ways in which people got children from the orphan trains. Founding Hospital put notices in newspapers around the Midwest, and people would write a description of the child they wanted. The CIS had the children line up by height order on a train platform or city hall. Then farmers or whoever came would often check the children with similar tests to slave auctions because they wanted strong children for labor. The term orphan train is actually misleading due to the fact that less than half of the children who rode the trains were orphans. About 25% had two living parents. The children with parents were sent to the trains because country living and training was believed to prevent development of bad habits and kept them away from the evil city. Agencies such as the Children's Mission actually developed a placing out system before the CAS did and many other groups followed in Brace's footsteps, some even as far away as Western Europe. The New York Foundling Hospital, a Catholic organization, was one of the largest American agencies to employ a like system. Catholic agencies were highly critical of the CAS and accused the agency of placing Catholic children in Protestant homes in an effort at conversion. New York Foundling was successful at finding Catholic homes for Catholic children but its task was more difficult given that fewer Catholic families lived in rural areas. Miss Sims is gonna miss us. No, she won't. She's busy. But there's nice people here. We can get us a family. We don't need nobody but us, sir. I'll take care of you. But you and me's too young to be a family. We ain't all grown up yet. Be nice to have a home for a while at least. Some of the children were faced with conditions that approached child slavery, while others were taken in like part of the family. The new families were expected to treat the children like one of their own and provide love as well as shelter. The boys typically performed farm labor and the girls engaged in domestic work. Like religion, racism shaped the fate of the children riding the orphan trains. The orphan trains genuinely neglected the African American community, although the national known Colored Orphan Asylum developed a similar program that placed their ward with African-American farms close to New York. There are instances of the CAS placing African-American children, but these are generally children who would pass for white and many of them encountered racism within their host families. The CAS often boasted of high success rates by noting the significant accomplishments of some of the children. For instance, John Brady, the governor of Alaska, was a CAS ward, yet historians also recognize that many children were exploited and abused. There were people who volunteered to check up on the kids, but the process wasn't taken very seriously. Children were property, so even if the volunteer did check in, they had believed the word of the adult over the child. Children rarely were taken out of homes because they didn't know what to do with them afterwards. A quarter of a million children rode these trains, but most of them thought that their train was the only one because they didn't reach out to each other. Although agencies can't claimed to maintain communication through writing, it was not uncommon for agencies to lose all communication after initial placement. Contracts were signed between the organization and the people who took in the children until the age of 21. They were required to feed, clothe, and send them to school for four months in a year. 
Critics argued that the Foster families were barely well screened and were briefly interviewed, if at all, collecting only the most superficial information about them. Agencies became more careful about family screening, but by 1900, several Midwestern states adopted legislation limiting the placement of children. In the progressive era, a new generation of children's advocates suggested that dependent children should remain with their families of origin whenever possible, which struck a deep blow to the placing out philosophy. Although the trains continued to run the first decades of the 20th century, they served very few children. The last orphan train ran its route in 1929. By then, the orphan trains had served more than 200,000 children. The orphan trains left a mixed legacy and helped children in need.